every luxury car manufacturer tries to create a model that suits every need. Unfortunately, every once in a while, they create a model that is a literal disaster. Vehicles that are way too technologically advanced and won't last, or vehicles that just lack the luster that these summer brands should offer up, or models that are as exciting as vanilla yogurt. I'm gonna share my opinion on the worst single model in the luxury car segment of every major luxury car manufacturer. Let's get into it now. Life's too short to drive boring cars. BMW has some of the hottest cars to drive on the market today. Whether we're talking about the brand new M4 Competition, or the mighty BMW M5 with over 600 horsepower, or one of the class leading 3 Series cars mid-size saloon that a lot of people are buying. BMW does create a lot of different models for a lot of different people, but there's one model that I truly believe is the worst on their list. And it's this little rig right here. We're talking about the BMW 2 Series. Let's take a closer look. Yeah, they have the great LED tail lights and you can get the all wheel drive system on this 228i. Of course, they have some great designs here. Very sporty looking vehicle and very flashy looking interior here as well. You do get sunroof on top and great fold away mirrors with laser cut wheels and the beautiful front nose of these particular BMWs do make them stand out. But the problem with this generation of 2 Series when they transitioned into this specific subcompact style little sedan right here is the fact that they went and utilized a front wheel drive platform type vehicle. And everybody knows BMWs known for their driving dynamics. The best driving experiences often comes from many BMWs, but a big part of that has to do with the gearboxes, the aggressive handling as well as the performance and rear wheel drive technology makes sure that it always gets you into that right mode of operation. But this vehicle here comes standard with front wheel drive. It's BMW's only model that actually runs a front wheel drive. With the all wheel drive then it actually adds a little extra traction to the back but predominantly is the front wheel drive and that in itself is why it's not a true BMW and the lowest one on their totem pole. What's the worst model that Audi has to offer? Is it this rig right here? This is literally one of Audi's hot rod vehicles. A true enthusiast will love this because this is the Audi RS6 Avant that everybody loves these if you like performance cars and you like going fast and you like the practicality because you have four doors, you have the trunk. Sport touring vehicles like this are popular in Europe. Even here they're catching on in North America because this thing brings serious performance to the equation with massive exhaust tips like down there. And if you have beautiful LED strips, oversized wheels and just a great stance overall, everybody loves the RS6. So that's not the problem. This is the worst right here. Big LED lights, you can tell this one is the e-tron here with the big grill that is clearly an electric vehicle. Yeah, you have laser cut rims and you have the e-tron plug-in pieces. Lots of great detail there. The interior is high quality as typical in most Audi products these days. Lots of great sunroof action on top, LEDs on the back, a very beautiful looking unit. This is the Q8 version of the Audi e-tron as mentioned already. These in my opinion are the worst vehicles in Audi's fleet right now. Currently because the charging infrastructure is poor, you pretty much have to plug into this flow charger right here and the network is very, very weak and difficult to get access to. We also can't forget some of the quality control issues, infotainment system crapping out, the regenerative braking on these vehicles has been a problem as has a general technology overload here. We've had batteries shorting out because of liquid and condensation landing on the batteries. This vehicle has had an assortment of problem areas. So while Audi has had its assortment of issues with internal combustion engines, with water leaks, coolant problems, of course, engine oil leaks, timing chain failures, the transformation into the electrified world hasn't exactly been seamless, and this vehicle clearly has some polishing left to do. And sadly enough, this one currently is at the bottom of the totem pole for Audi. And there we have the next vehicle. Obviously, this one here, if you can see on the front grille, is made by Infinity. And this represents their worst offering right here, in my opinion, because of several attributes. But let's take a look. First of all, I have to say this thing looks like a giant milk carton on wheels. So it's not particularly attractive, never really has been. This thing is absolutely ginormous. From oversized headlights, to oversized pet boy grills, to oversized back long extension at the back, roof racks you can't even reach, as well as a long bulbous back end with some fake low grade chrome on the the very back that doesn't wear particularly well and we're looking at the QX80. And this one does have this 
the 5.6 liter V8 engine tucked under that hood. Now, while there were problems with the earlier generation V8 engines that had timing chain guides and issues with that, they would catastrophically fail. This later generation generally was looked after, but there were many other problems with these vehicles. Exhaust manifolds. So off the engine, you have the exhaust system. They're very prone to cracking, splitting. You'll hear kind of a kind of a cracking, spitting noise. Clearly a common problem here. Another issue is transmission. Now it could be rectified with some reprogramming of the TCU and the ECU to actually get some of that judderness and shaky and lurchingness out of there. It generally wasn't too many catastrophic failures, but there was more of a drivability concern. It's sitting on its back end right here. As you can see, the front, it sits up a little higher the back right there, it's quite low. Because the air ride suspension that's equipped in this vehicle is not unlike a lot of BMWs, where the X5s would tend to sag, you have the same problem right here, where the air ride suspension starts to settle out, you get leaks, and all of a sudden you find yourself sagging at the back end, and that just translates the dollars out of your pocket. There's also been electronic issues, as well as a host of other random troubles throughout. The quality control isn't the best, but the bottom line is, in today's day and age, nobody needs a vehicle that gets only nine miles per gallon in the city and about 16 or 17 miles per gallon on the freeway. That's just unacceptable in today's day and age and you can't even afford to drive this thing anymore with gas prices on the rise the way they've been in the last number of months and years. This thing becomes very much cost prohibitive to own and operate. So this represents something that's much of a dinosaur and clearly on the way of the dodo bird. It actually pains me to say this because Lexus has ultra reliable vehicles and even this one here in particular isn't because of reliability issues so much. It's more drivability, ergonomics, quality, fit and finish. It feels a little unrefined. Of course, your classic Lexus oversized grille, as you can see, it's blue, so there's hybrid there. Of course, you have these beautiful headlights. This is a stylish looking front end on there. You've got the little details on there as well as this quite an interesting little flare and then it sort of squares off LC 500 mirrors and I like that. Of course, you have a set of basic looking handles and the interior is actually fairly well put together for an entry level Lexus vehicle. Of course, you do get a sunroof and some beautiful roof racks on top. Love the rear tail lights. Very much the Toyota product. You can see the family bloodline right there. And as we cycle along right there, you see the overhang. It's a very sporty looking little sport compact SUV. Very much like a BMW X1 is what we have right here. Of course, we have the beautiful laser cut rims as typical. So clearly Lexus being the master of hybrid technology, you wonder what's wrong with this vehicle? Well, let's face it. It's really performance. It doesn't have a lot of it. With about 180 horsepower, does a zero to 60 just under nine seconds, making it very soft, relaxed type of acceleration. It also couples up to a CVT, which, you know, Lexus generally, the only time they use CVTs, of course, is when they utilize the hybrid tech, but CVTs are never the greatest technology for transmissions. Now, while it gets phenomenal fuel mileage, there's been some complaints by customers. The infotainment system inside has been quirky, not so responsive. The vehicle has been known to be slow performer. A few glitches, brakes are a little bit weak, and the acceleration is meager. Now, the fuel economy is the trade-off, and this car wasn't meant to be a race car. But the other piece that a lot of people comment on are the slightly rough, unrefined drivetrain and the ride that you get with it. The vehicle feels very rough down the road, hammering down the road. doesn't have that Lexus luxurious feel to it. It really does feel more like an entry-level Toyota and not so much Lexus, which is their upscale brand. And that's why the UX 250H, like we see right here, is clearly not the vehicle that I would choose and I would put it at the bottom of their barrel. And the next brand right here, we have this little hot rod right here, Buick, which is clearly a product of GM Chevrolet. But this Enclave here isn't the bottom of the barrel of this brand, even though quality and GM generally doesn't go very well together. It's actually this vehicle right here. Of course, they have a restyled set of headlights. This is a remake, peel away, stick away chrome. Of course, you do have some nice color keyed bumper trim there, and this is an Avenir, but that's a trim level. Of course, we do have this beautiful two-tone right here, and the interior basically feels like you're sitting in the bottom of a barrel. Right there, we have this beautiful little roof rack on top, and you do have some space in the back as well for some other slightly grumpy and unhappy customers right there. Right here, we have a beautiful set of wheels. I love those rims, absolutely. And along the front, of course, we do get this really busy looking grill, which definitely does make this car stand out, but not necessarily in the best of ways. Remember, this is a luxury vehicle. This particular version should compete with the likes of the BMW X1 or the Volvo XC40 as well as Audis. You know, they all have something and unfortunately, while this looks interesting and 
kind of intriguing on its own. Once you park it next to some of the high players, it starts to feel a little low key and drab. Interesting little detail like right here. And as we cycle back here, we see this overhang here, typical SUV style. And I like these, it looks like a fishbowl here pretty much. It's kind of an interesting looking tail light assembly on this Avenir. Of course, they have some great details along the bottom as well with this little splitter and of course some nice high piano gloss finishing there on this Encore GX and it is all wheel drive here. I just can't get behind a vehicle like this. It's front wheel drive. Most proper luxury vehicles or performance cars should be rear wheel drive at bare minimum or all wheel drive driven predominantly from the rear wheels. This also has a CVT transmission, continuously variable transmission. Another knock against it, not necessarily the best thing, but unfortunately this has two engine configurations, a 1.2 liter three cylinder engine that is gasping for air at every opportunity, makes about 137 horsepower and there's a 1.3 liter three cylinder engine that makes about 155 horsepower, also equally anemic. And sadly enough, when you're competing with the likes of BMW and Volvo for that luxury car space, this car just sort of leaves you hollow. But now what we have here is this Range Rover, but it's not this one as much because, I mean, people know what they're getting into when they're buying a Range Rover Sport or the full size Range Rover. The problem is when you see one of these little units right here, this is where you actually get into a Range Rover thinking you're gonna get one of those, but you don't, you get one of these. And this is the vehicle I truly believe isn't necessarily up to the standard of Range Rover. Some might like these because they do look cute, they do look stylish, and I do agree that they do look quite attractive. This is the kind of SUV that instills all kinds of different feelings and thoughts in my mind. As a matter of fact, this evokes a lot of anger and disruption in my mind just buying these and having to own this for a long period of time because it has a lot of little problems, nickel and dime. Older generations had a lot of issues, newer generations a little better, but still you can pretty much almost bang on having issues with transmissions, you can expect electrical problems, you can expect steering issues, brakes, electric brakes, and all sorts of nickel and dime problems. The bigger issue is of course the service cost. At when you're having to check the vehicle in annually for your service, you would expect to pay over a thousand bucks for every service. Every nickel and dime issue that you bring this vehicle in for is going to cost you a significant amount of money just to be able to drive around with that brand name. So in my mind, if you're going to drive a Range Rover at all, go all the way in because this one here, while it seems fun and fresh and consistent with the brand, the only thing consistent is the fact you're getting ripped off and what's not so great is the fact that you don't get all the frivolous experiences that you would with the full size Range Rover HSE Sport like the other one or the full end Range Rover. Right there's the next vehicle on my list that I just can't get behind and I truly believe it's the lowest of the low on this particular brand. Many people are not buying these right now. They're not very popular. And while electric vehicles are becoming onward and upward and a lot of people are getting on board, the fact remains it's still a tough sell. And a lot of the non-Tesla brand of EVs are finding themselves very difficult to sell their OEM products. Of course, we've seen that problem with Mercedes-Benz, the EQS, EQE vehicles. We've seen that in a lot of manufacturers, and this is no different. Not to mention the fact that it's a risk. We have a car here that's going to be limited for its opportunity for charging stations and all of that goodness, but the reliability is going to be a questionable one. We know this brand here, as you can see right here on the wheel, is a Cadillac right there, and Cadillacs generally don't get a real good thumbs up. They're generally in that two out of five predicted reliability by consumer reports amongst most of their models and as a result I wouldn't expect anything much more on this one. Time will tell how this pans out but right now it's not a very popular vehicle and quite frankly I'm not loving the looks of them either. Very bold front that's almost too much. Very large plastic style grill is almost just too exaggerated. And then as you look along the back the proportions are all wrong here. I don't know if this is a car, truck, SUV, minivan, station wagon. I'm not sure what to make of it, but it is a very odd proportioned vehicle. The back end looks like it hangs out too far. And quite frankly, I just think it was designed by a robot. This doesn't look all that well, in my opinion. Sure, while there's great touches, you have door handles that are recessed, a very interesting interior with a great corner to corner display. And while there's a lot of great details on these vehicles like this, great laser cut wheels, and of course some interesting headlights by you typically find on Cadillac products. And so what is this Cadillac here that actually literally makes the bottom of the barrel? It's the Lyric right there. As you can see, the reliability, the technology, and the overall looks of this vehicle just have to say, try something else. There's many other great options out there. Give this one some time, who knows? You might be convinced, but right now, I don't think it has the staying power in my personal opinion.
happen. This little hot rod here is the big brother, or little brother, if you will, of Ford Motor Company. And what we have here clearly is a Lincoln, as we see right there. And this vehicle here is one to note as actually one of the worst, least reliable SUVs actually that you can get your hands on this year. What's the problem with this vehicle? A lot of people love them. They actually look great. And I'm not gonna lie, it's a very upright SUV. It's large, third row, three liter V6, puts out great power, zero to 65 and a half seconds. It's a spectacular little runabout. The interior is absolutely gorgeous for a Ford. Seats are nicely bolstered, nice quality leather interior, great technology. Obviously, you have a lot of great touch and feel in these vehicles. Look, there's even a sunroof on top. Of course, you have these great fold-away mirrors, absolutely beautiful, and what we have here is the Aviator. Of course, there's a lot of great attributes to this vehicle, but the problem is, Consumers Reports gives it like a bottom of the barrel, one out of five, and it comes with good cause. For example, there's a lot of issues you've found on earlier generations of this, and predicted reliability does not bode very well with these vehicles. There's five recalls in total for these vehicles. Back over protection issues, you don't want to run over somebody or something but there's th three of those we also see powertrain issues as well as seat belt related recalls for these vehicles a few problem areas you can find with these are the in-car electronics all of the technology there's many cases and many stories of failures in these vehicles drive system powertrain of course transmissions as well as engines that aren't necessarily up to the snuff steering related issues and as well as suspension that bangs and there's been a lot of premature complaints about people having to rebuild some of their suspension issues in these vehicles paint and trim and electronics in general so i mean even right here you can see we don't have great alignment right here between the door panel as well as the front fender so that's an issue as well as the paint quality electronics throughout and generally it's just too problematic to give it the green light and sadly enough this ranks as one of the most unreliable modern day luxury SUVs. Mercedes-Benz is one of those manufacturers that's clearly known for innovation, performance, technology, and of course, luxury car motoring. But there is in fact one specific type of model that at this point I'd put them low on the totem pole and probably the lowest one that you definitely don't want to consider buying. There's certainly better versions out there to consider before that. And it's actually what we're looking at right here. We're talking about the Mercedes-Benz EQE EQS. That's right, they're the new EVs by Mercedes-Benz. Now they're beautiful, they're spectacular, gorgeous vehicles, great technology. They actually have some great design themes I mean just look you know you've got the flush handles here you've got fold away mirrors lots of glass on the roof you have these flat beautiful black panels on the front and it definitely stands out quite unique but the problem with these vehicles is the fact that there's too much technology it's a little early in the game early adopters will find that there may be issues there have been some recalls related to thousands of vehicles that have to go back because of a sudden propulsion issue or there's a possibility that the vehicle will slow down and lose power while you're in the midst of accelerating could be an electrical issue with a plug but nonetheless it's a problem that needs to go back to the dealer for further warranty assessment but the reality is it's just that type of vehicle it's early in the game mercedes-benz will definitely get all the technology right but it'll take some time and it'll be complex and it might even cost you huge money on the used car market if in fact you're keeping these vehicles for a significant period of time so personally at this point Lots of great Mercedes-Benz on the roster to pick from. Personally, I would say the EQE, EQS, very complex. Charging station limitations, the electrification and the market and all of those nuances that go with that means that I'd probably put this at the bottom of the pole for Mercedes. And the next one is Acura, which is the upscale brand of Honda. Now, if we're being honest, I think Acura is an amazing brand. It's basically Honda quality, reliability, and they make some great models. You know, the NSX for one, the TLX is a great luxury brand, but this particular car here I would personally skip and I see this one here as being the bottom of the barrel here's the reality we're dealing with a car that is essentially reskinned more or less we're talking about this Acura ILX as well as now the new Integra is also basically a restamped rebadged Honda Civic with a little bit different marketing interiors reworked slightly different gearboxes and different engine configurations in some cases but the reality is the ILX like this is a simple car based on a Civic platform I'd say just go with the Honda Civic and you'll be good to go and the next model of a specific luxury brand that I would not recommend buying this is the F-Type R supercharged V8 5 liter Yes, reliability concerns a few, but it is such an amazing car that I wouldn't necessarily put that anywhere near the bottom. That's pretty much on the top. However, 
this model right here that's sitting in front of me is the Jag XE. Now, as you circle around, you'll notice it's more of their entry level model, and this is the S. So we have a supercharged V6, and this is definitely not the bottom of the barrel, although the XE is a model I would suggest trying to drive before you even just shrug these off. I mean, you do have a set of dual exhaust tips and some great wheels, and an interior that's somewhat fresh and follicle. It's a fun car, but there's a specific engine and configuration of the XE is the model that I'd suggest staying away from. And it's the engine that's tucked under the hood of this particular vehicle. Now, as you can see, it's the XE. So the XE is a fun vehicle. It's relatively affordable, more entry level for Jaguar, the brand, with this beautiful little puss in boots right there. Great little headlights on these vehicles, but it's the 2.0 diesel that I would stay away from. Because many Jaguars have some issues along the way. With that diesel engine, there's lots of conversation about timing chains, skipping a cog, rattling up, and the engine going bang. Because the fact remains, there's been a real big problem with some of the timing chains on these diesel engines. Now, while typically everybody loves a diesel engine, I love a great diesel engine that gives you great torque out of the hole. It's rattly, great on fuel. Everybody loves a diesel engine. However, with this particular unit, you've got to be aware of the timing chain ramps and tensioner issues that lead to potential catastrophic failure. There's been quite a few of them. Once you hit about 60 or 80,000 miles, it's time to really keep an eye on it. So personally, if you're going to go with the Jag XE, step it up, maybe go with some of the V6s, possibly the Ingenium 2.0, I would personally wade cautiously on that. All of them have their potential pitfalls, but it's the diesel engine here that I'd be particularly worried about. And with all of that said, right there, check it out. 2024's best SUVs. Hope to see you on the next one. We'll catch you all real soon. Bye-bye.